It isn't about me, and it isn't about the praise team. And what we ought to be seeing is we ought to see Jesus. That's what we want to see in this place. We hope that you have this morning and that, that God has blessed your heart already in this service. Visiting with us, we, we do communion most of the time in the middle of the service because we don't want to do Jesus and injustice and just as a tag on at the end of the service. So we want to take specific time. And yes, it does take away some of my preaching time when we do that. But I think it's important that we, we have those moments where we really focus upon Jesus Christ and we come with thankful hearts. Thank you, Lord, that you came to that cross and you shed your blood and I have forgiveness and I can have a relationship with you. And so we praise the Lord for that. I just want to encourage you, Wednesday nights, usually our prayer meeting night, but this Wednesday night we're having the, a group from New Brunswick Bible Institute come, and Brother Steve Wagstaff is going to be here. He's a great preacher. You'll enjoy that. I want to encourage you to make a special effort to come. I won't ask you to raise your hands and say you're going to, but I'd like to. But, but please, come back on Wednesday night. Uh, It'll encourage those young students as they seek to serve the Lord, and your heart will be blessed. So uh, please come, and then following that service, if some of you want to stay for a time of prayer, we'll do that, but you'll ha have the opportunity to leave before the prayer time if, if that's something that maybe you don't like praying together or you got things you have to do. So uh, we just ask you to keep that in mind. Remind you again, we're having uh, a men's prayer meeting on Friday mornings at 8.30 here. I was really encouraged on, on this past Friday morning with a good group of men that were here to pray together, to pray for God's blessing upon our church, for God to work in our midst, for God to save souls, change lives as we lead up to uh, the Wendell Calder meetings that we have at May 22nd through 24th, and we look forward to that so much. We have been talking about heaven for, I think this is the fourth or fifth week. I kind of lost track. But... You're not going to think I'm talking about heaven this morning, and I, I won't apologize for that because we're still in Revelation 21, but our, my desire has been that God would begin to place in all of our hearts a longing to be in His place, a longing to be with God. And I think sometimes we're just so attached to this old world and and we think that's all there is. But God says, I've got something better for you. And let's just read here in Revelation chapter 21 this morning where he begins. He says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Does it rejoice your heart to know that God says, I've got a new heaven and a new earth. This old world that you enjoy so much is a sin-cursed earth. Romans chapter 8 says, even this whole planet groans. It moans, it sends out tremors and earthquakes and destruction and so on. It's groaning from within, awaiting a day of redemption. When even the redemption that Christ accomplished on the cross is so far-reaching that it affects even this planet. It's going to affect this earth that we dwell on. It's going to affect the life on this planet, animals and so on. And yes, praise God, it's going to affect us. This glorious redemption that Christ has provided. I want us not to go kicking into heaven and, 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 and not wanting to go into heaven. I want us to go running towards it. I want us to be excited that one of these days I get to see Jesus eyeball to eyeball, up close and personal with Him. Yes, we enjoy a personal relationship here, but I got to tell you, it's not anything like what it's going to be then. And we ought to be excited about that. We've, we've seen here, he says, a new heaven, a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And we talked about that. And also there was no more sea. Sea separate us. There's not going to be anything in heaven that's going to separate us any longer. He says, and then I, John, saw the holy city. I want to tell you, the, the old city of Jerusalem is not a holy city. Some people go to the Holy Land and say, oh, it was so wonderful, I walked in, in the Holy Land. Well, I'm more looking for the Holy Land where Jesus is walking today, the place where he's alive and I'm going to be with him. The New Jerusalem, he says, I saw it coming down from heaven. To where? To the new earth. 
this place that Jesus promised in John 14 that he was going to prepare for us, that place is coming. And he says, it's coming as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God is with men, and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with, will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Some of you are here this morning. And there's tears in your eyes because of some things that you're going through in this life. Some of you, as you think of heaven, you think of a loved one over there. Maybe a daughter. It may be a wife. And it brings sorrow to your heart. I want to tell you there's a day when we're in heaven and Jesus is going to come up to us. And he's going to take our hands, our face in his hands. And he's going to wipe away every tear from our eyes. No more tears. And no more sorrow. And no more dying. And no more death. And praise God, no more sin in that place. What a wonderful topic that God chooses to use to finish off his book, the Bible. The last two chapters are about heaven. And what a glorious, wonderful place it's going to be. And we need to rejoice in that place. We've, one of the things that I see as we look at heaven is it's everything we've ever wanted. There's something in the heart of every human being that longs for a place. I remember reading about it in school, about a, a utopia. And talking about a utopian society and somehow we were going to create that. Forget that. We're kind of going in the wrong direction to create a utopia, right? Too much perversion and wickedness and sin and Christlessness in people's lives for that to ever take place here. But in this new place, this new heaven and the new Jerusalem, he says, there's going to be this utopia. Why do you think we have a longing in our heart for that place? Because God puts it there because he knows that he's got the fulfillment of that coming for us. And he puts it there so he's hoping we'll respond to the glorious truth of the gospel that we talked about in this table of how that Christ died for our sins to provide redemption and forgiveness and cleansing so that we could go to this place where there will be an utter utopia. And it's not just pie in the sky. As a matter of fact, it doesn't stay in the sky. It comes down to earth. The new earth that he's going to create for us. And it talks here. I had somebody come to me, oh, probably two, three weeks ago, and and they were saying, I I, I think you're wrong, Pastor, to talk about the church as the bride of Christ. And they used this passage. They said, it says here that this new Jerusalem comes down, and, and so it's the new Jerusalem that's the bride of Christ. And I thought about that. What do you think about that? And I thought about it for a bit, and I thought about this. I look at the city of Fredericton, and I was out biking yesterday and out across the walking bridge, and, and, and the thought came to my mind, this is a beautiful city. Would you agree with that? Fredericton's a beautiful city. Sorry if you're from St. John, but that's not a beautiful city. But Fredericton's a beautiful city. Listen carefully. If I say it's a beautiful city, you think it's the place. If I say it's a wicked city, am I right? When I speak of it as a wicked city, I'm not talking about the place. I'm talking about the what? I'm talking about the people. So when God talks about the new Jerusalem, it's a place, right? Great and beautiful, but it's also the people. It's the bride. It's the bride that's coming back because they've been caught up together to be with him in the air. And so when it talks about the bride, yes, it's a city, but it's it's the people. And the great news about that is that just as he's making that city, and I think a physical city, a beautiful place for us, he's making us beautiful for that place. Doesn't he promise that he's going to present us before him without fault? blameless, blameless before the throne. He's still got a lot of work on his hands to get me to that place, I know. But he's promised he's going to do it. 
praise God that he's at work and that we're going to enjoy this wonderful place called heaven. Listen, he's talking here, and it's significant that as he wraps up these last two chapters, the focus is on heaven, but listen carefully, it's on the church. Why? Because Christ loves the church. He loves this body of people that have put their faith and hope and trust in Him. The church is the bride of Christ. It's made up of God's forgiven, purified people. You know what's amazing? I was talking to somebody up at MBBI. And he says, let me introduce you to my bride. I said, well, what's so unusual about that? Found out they've been married for 39 years. Most guys at that point call her the wife. But in this man's heart, she was still his what? His bride. His bride. And what's amazing, with everything God knows about me and you and all the other Christians around the world, with all of our bumps and pimples and everything else in our lives, he still calls us his what? His bride. Right to the last chapter of the book, he's talking about the bride. Now, let me just say a few words this morning about the church and its importance, because I think we're losing it. The sense of the bride being important today, because there's so many Christians that I run into, and I'll ask them, they'll say, oh, I'm a Christian. I say, well, where did you go to church? Oh, I don't go to church. la di da that's not important. I want you to know it's important to Christ. He died to build the church. Might shock you a little bit, but he didn't die for you as an individual so that you could just get to heaven someday. He saved you so you could be part of the bride, this body of people called the church. And you're disobedient. You're disobedient if you're not part of his church and his bride. Now, I know there are people out there that have all sorts of issues with the church in our day. And they can tell you stories. Listen, if you got a few hours after the service, I'll tell you some stories about the church. Negative stories, bad stories. And I know people have all sorts of issues with it. People have been hurt by the church. Be, Be honest, how many of you have been hurt at some point by the church? You're in church, you don't lie. People get hurt by the church. That's just a fact of life. People have bad experiences. Sometimes it's because of the past or sometimes it's because of the people. Sometimes local churches are just plain dead. And they're formal and they're unfriendly. I remember the first church that I pastored and and, and walked into it. Not Cross Creek, but another one. I won't tell you where. But I... (laughs) I walked into that church, and they sat there like this, and nobody spoke or said hello when I came in or when I went out. (laughs) It was just cold. But let me say something very, very profound. You need to get over it. You just need to get over it because Christ loves the church with all of its problems and all of its different things depending on where you're going to church and what's wrong. Listen, I'll guarantee you there's something wrong with every church. Get in there and know some of the people, interact with them, you'll find out there's problems. If that's your excuse for not wanting to be a Christian, if that's your excuse for not following God, get over it. Some complain the church is too much, run too much like a business. And others complain that it's terrible, there's not enough organization. (laughs) It's not run enough like a business. Some complain because they think it's just too much authority, and I don't like authority, and 
Others think, well, it's bad authority and they, they don't give good godly leadership and so I don't like the church. I want to tell you that the church is what Christ gave his life for. The church is mentioned in the body as a, a community of people that are to come together and serve God together. It's, it's called a body. It's called, you know, if, if I start dismembering your body and putting an arm over here and another arm over here and a foot out there and another foot over there somewhere, what are you? You're not a body any longer. You're a dismembered body. Christ didn't die to have a dismembered body. He died that his body might glorify him and live for him and serve him with all of their hearts. He says, we're a flock. A flock isn't one sheep over here and one over there. It's a flock going together, moving forward together. He calls us a family, the family of God. Sometimes we sing that little chorus, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. A family is people that live together, right? And they, they eat together and they do things together. And God says, that's what I died for. The, the church is called a fellowship. A people that, that enjoy being together and do things together and serve God together. It's a fellowship. A church is first and foremost. The very word church is a word that means an assembly where we come together to worship God and praise God and pray to God and give to God and all the things that we do when we gather together here for a service. We come together to serve Him. I read this article. This is sort of where you're saying, Pastor's on a rant this morning. That's okay. You're right. I am. I read an article. I don't like it. It says this. Here's the, here's the title to the article. It says, Church, it's time to wake up. This is a secular magazine. It's not a Christian magazine. Church, it's time to wake up. Well, that got my attention. And here's what, here's what it says. Contemporary culture thinks you have it wrong. Organized religion just doesn't resonate with them anymore. Frankly, when in the world did contemporary culture ever think the church had it right? They didn't in Rome, they didn't in Ephesus, they didn't in Philippi. They never thought the church had it right. I'm not about worrying whether my culture thinks I got it right. I'm more concerned, does Jesus think we got it right? That we come together and we worship him, not the world we live in. People talk about, I don't like organized religion. We just want it freestyle. There's a cruise line that advertises freestyle cruising. You know, just no rules. You can go sit down and eat whenever you want and all that stuff. But listen, anytime you get 30 people together, somebody has to start to think about organization. You have to start to think about who determines when we're going to meet. Who determines when we come together where we're going to sit. Aren't you glad that somebody put chairs in here to sit on or you'd be sitting on the floor like we did in India, right? Little mats on the floor. How, how many of you want us to go for that? We'll sell the pews and get mats. Somebody had to think about that. Somebody has to organize that. We have lights on here, here this morning because it was, we're organized enough that somebody pays the bills. It takes some organization. Get over it. You're going to have a group of people called the church. We've got to get organized. Maybe we're not as organized as we should be, but we need some organization. I don't like all the meetings, but somehow things have to get done. Decisions have to be made. It would be a lot simpler if they just said, Pastor, you go ahead and make them. But there's going to be committees. There's going to be boards. You, you can... Call them what you like, task forces. You know, some say, we're moving away from boards. We got task forces. You got just another name for a committee and a board. That's all you got. You can, you can call it the thrill-seeking adventure journey group if you want to, but it's still a board. Decisions have to be made.
We're to be an assembly. It meets together with a focus on King Jesus. To worship Him and love Him and extol Him and, and evangelize for Him and tell others how they need to put their faith and hope and trust in Him. I have people say, oh, I don't like the church. It's, it's all about just programs. Hey, 10.50 this morning. We call it the morning service. Get over it. It's a program. The music's planned. The preaching is planned. I sit down and study all week to get ready to preach the Word of God. It's a program. People today want Christianity without authority. They want a Christianity without borders. They want it. Christianity without doctrinal boundaries. They want Christianity without standards of conduct or responsibility. They want Christianity without moral expectations. They want Christianity without commitment. They want Christianity without any kind of accountability. But frankly, if you take all those things away, you don't have Christianity at all. And you don't have the church. So get over it. Get over yourself. And get Walk in obedience to God and get involved with his church and love Jesus and love his church. And yes, some of us are unlovable. You're saying, Pastor, right now, what you're saying this morning, you're a little unlovable. Well, go to work and love me. Not supposed to be easy all the time. Sometimes it's hard. What, how does it reflect Christ if we just love the people that are lovable? Sometimes I think God puts some of you in here just so we have to work on loving. I won't point any fingers this morning, but. We have a generation that loves to talk about community. The only problem is, anytime you get a community together, you get people that gossip, people that lie about one another, people that are sarcastic and mean-spirited. Have you ever found that? You put a half dozen people together in a workplace and you're going to find out they're not all nice to get along with. Don't expect the church is going to be any different. We come from different backgrounds and, and, and all of that. And the great news is one of these days we will be perfect. He will make us perfect. And God comes to this last book of the Bible And he wants to talk about the church. The church, yes, where some people talk too much. And others don't talk enough, at least about Jesus. He calls us to a church where sometimes people are very opinionated. And where some people aren't opinionated enough. They don't have any backbone. He calls us to a church where sometimes people are rude and sarcastic where some people complain and pout if they don't get their own way, and some are stingy, but he calls it a church where some are amazingly encouraging and amazingly generous. He calls us to a church where some people hold grudges. Seems like they'll hold them for eternity, but they won't. There are some people that are pessimistic and can only see the problems, but thank God there are some that are cheerfully inspiring and say, Pastor, hang in there. Better days are coming. But he calls us to the church. He calls us to be a body of believers that serve him. And, and when you think about the church and all of its problems, we got any problems at Devon Park? But the fact is, that's what God's got to work with. <laughs> And he calls you in Christ to work together with all those problems and all the messes that we have to deal with. People complain, say, oh, the church is full of hypocrites. Somebody said that to me the other day. I said, where would you rather they were? Wouldn't you rather they were in church where they could hear something from the Word of God and get their life changed? At least there's some hope that way. Love the hypocrite. Love them to Christ. Love them to a changed life and a changed way of living. Love them out of his hypocrisy. Love them into reality and his relationship with the Lord. That's what he calls us to. He's working to make us pure. 
He's working to make us beautiful. And I rant on this this morning a little bit because I want you to see Devon Park with that kind of a vision. Not walking in here to say, oh, is this the perfect place for everybody going to do everything for me? No, it's not a perfect place, but it's a place where if you come in and you pick up your shovel and you go to work, we can make this a better place for everybody to serve the Lord and to be a part of this fellowship of people. It's all part of God helping us to get that robe of righteousness placed just right on our shoulders, to walk into his presence. And the fact is, in order to accomplish that, he has to put some people in my life that are ornery. He has to put some people in my life that disagree with me, and I've got to figure out how do I work together with them. And in the working together with them and the Spirit of God working in my heart and the Word working in my heart, I get changed more and more into the image of Christ. If all of us were just totally agreeable and got along perfectly together, it would be difficult for Christ to do a lot in our lives, to be honest. It's the difficulties of life where you grow. Have you found that? It's the difficult people in life that make you grow. If you determine, I'm going to live for Christ, no matter what they say or what they do, I'm going forward for Christ. He's just getting ready for the day when the new heaven and the new earth appear and we come down with him out of glory to this new earth to dwell with him forever. And did you get it? And he will dwell with them and be their God. What a day, what a place it's going to be. He says that he's called us out to be his peculiar people. Now, some of you have taken that a little too far. You're a little bit too peculiar. But, but peculiar, he means special. I want you to be my special people that, that are set apart from the world to serve me and focus on me. I think in order for this to happen, we, we're going to have to get our gospel right. I say, Pastor, what are you talking about? We got our gospel right at Devon Park. I, I wonder. If, if the gospel is just about you getting saved so that you go to heaven someday, you haven't got your gospel right. Because the gospel is God. The gospel is all about God. The gospel is all about you getting redeemed and changed for his what? For his glory. It's not all about you. It's all about him getting our focus on Jesus Christ and allowing him to work in our lives and change us. It's all about, what do we call it? The kingdom. You can't have a kingdom unless... You have a king who's on the throne. And you've got to come willingly and bow before that throne and acknowledge Jesus as king, that Jesus Christ is what? He's Lord. Lord of all. And it doesn't matter whether somebody shook your hand when you came in or when you go out today. It doesn't matter whether somebody spoke to you or they didn't. The question is, did God speak to you? Was your heart open to have God speak into your life? That's why I spend my life trying to get people to come to the place where they're prepared to bend the knee to King Jesus and acknowledge Him as their Lord and Savior and Master. Coming to bend before him. That's the good news of the gospel. That, that a people that formerly who were alienated from God by their sin and separated from him can be brought near to bow before him and give him the glory. Revelation 21 is about the fulfillment of God's plan. It's about the fulfillment of God's promises where Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And, and when the time comes, right, he's coming back. He's going to receive us unto himself, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The Lord will be our God for all time. The king will be in residence there, and we will be what? His people. His people. Question this morning, 
Do you long for that? Do you have a longing in your heart for that day to be in that situation where you fall on your face before him and your heart cries out, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. What a day, what a day that will be. I, I've been counseling with a whole bunch of couples. It's driving me crazy. Preparing them for their wedding day. We got five weddings going to go on or more this summer. And I, I ask them sometimes, what are you looking for? You know, in marriage. And you look at the guy and that's a no-brainer. He just looks at me and you, he doesn't say it because he's too embarrassed to say it in front of the preacher, but sex. I don't know if you can say that word to Baptist church or not. But one, one of the couples, a couple of weeks ago I was talking with, made this comment. We, what are we looking forward to? We're looking forward where we won't have to separate and go to separate homes at night. Where we can go to bed together and wake up together and have somebody to share life with. It's joys and it's sorrows. Oh, that's a great answer. That's a great answer. And in the new heaven and the new earth, we will be forever looking forward to it. Together with Him. Is there something in your heart that longs to see Jesus? I hear people say, boy, I can't wait to get to heaven. I've got all these questions. I don't have any questions. You say, Pastor, you're arrogant. You think you've got all the answers. No, that's not it. I just can't wait to be so engulfed in his glory. I don't even care about the questions anymore. Just care about Jesus. And loving on Jesus. Because he went to the cross for me. And he's changed my life. And I think where I could be today if I hadn't come to know Christ. And it terrifies me. And I am so thankful for Jesus this morning. Are you? Praise his name. Let me read just a little something for you. I'll try and condense it. There was a preacher many, many years ago by the name of Christopher Love. I never knew anything about him before, but I came across this article. And Christopher Love was in prison for preaching the gospel. And he was writing letters back and forth with his wife. And I, I wish I could share all that with you, but I, I can't. But one of, the, one of the things that he writes to us, or his wife writes to him, she says this, Though your head be separated from your body, and it was going to be, and it was, though your head be separated from your body, instantly you shall be joined to your head. <laughs> what a great thought. Sever my head from my body. Instantly, I'm going to be joined together with my head. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He writes back to her, <laughs> I go now from the prison to the palace. Why? Because of Jesus. Jesus. Because of what he did for us on the cross of Calvary. And I hope, I hope, that's your hope today. That when you leave this world, you're going to be with him forever. And you'll be surprised. That was my introduction. It's also, you'll be glad to know the ending of my message. 
But I didn't get to what I really plan to preach on this morning. But we'll get there, Lord willing, if the rapture doesn't come first. The rapture comes, Mike is going to finish the message for me. I plan to preach on Revelation 21.8, so you know what's coming. But the main thought there is that there are some people that are not going to be there. And I can tell you it breaks my heart when I think about the possibility that you won't be there. Because you'd never come to the place where you're willing to acknowledge, yes, I'm a sinner. I've committed sins against God. I've committed them in my mind with my thoughts. I've committed them with my tongue, with my words. I've committed them with my hands, with the deeds that I have done. I'm a sinner. And then the light bulb goes on and you see that God has sent the Savior for sinners. To rescue you from your sin. To give you forgiveness and to give you the gift of God which is eternal life. Where you will live forever with Him. Where? in this glorious place called heaven. I can only read it, but verse 8 says this, but the cowardly, isn't that an interesting word to start the list with, the cowardly? Now, I wish I could explain that to you. I won't because I can hear your stomachs growling. But it says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Eternity. Their place or our place? That's the choice. That's the choice. In the place where you're wrapped in tar and brimstone and fire for eternity. Or in this glorious place called heaven that God has for you. To be there with him. And I can't make the choice for you. I wish I could. If I thought it would work this morning, I'd come back there and take every one of you right by the shirt collar. And I'd shake you silly. So you just said, okay, pastor, I get it. I'm going to trust Jesus as my Savior. Because none of us knows that we'll be back here next Sunday. And I don't want you walking out the door this morning without changing teams. Get off of Satan's team and join God's team. So how do I do that? Well, simply by faith. Repenting of your sin and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior by faith. Now, I'm not going to explain because all that that means right now, but I'm going to say this. Praise team's going to come, and they're going to sing, and they can, they can come already. And as they sing, I'm going to be here at the front. And if God's spoken to your heart and you say, you know what? I don't want to be with the cowardly and the immoral and the sorcerers and all of those people for eternity. I want to be where Jesus is. Just slip from that seat and come down this aisle. What it will do is give me an opportunity to go aside with you, and in just a few minutes, five to seven minutes, I'll try to explain the gospel to you. I'll try to answer questions that you might have. And you can make the choice of whether you want to pray and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. God's speaking to you. Don't do it because I'm speaking to you. If God's speaking to your heart this morning, why don't you come and say an everlasting yes to Jesus Christ and receive him as your king? Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus.